Hello, hello, hello. Welcome or welcome back. My room smells like jasmine. Um, the sun is out. Summer is basically like already here. Let me know if summer is like actually like here here um where you live or it's just like kind of like slowly stretching around the corner um let me know but if you saw the title you know what we are doing here today we are going to be analyzing the anthology tracks from the tortured poets department i wanted to really wait until i was like itching and enthusiastic to talk about these tracks and like do this analysis to do it and actually also give the tortured poets department standard edition it's due time and give those tracks their thought as an album fully and separately as that is the standard edition of the Tortured Poets Department and these are kind of I think of these as bonus tracks I don't think of this as a separate album in and of itself like a folklore evermore situation I don't think of them as like sisters or even twins I think of this as like an extension of ones that didn't maybe make it on to the standard edition but are still kind of part of the same world same story same time period same thought train maybe do i think some of them could have been left off or left for later yes but that's actually not part of this video we will talk about that when i rank them but first we have to talk about these songs individually because they're some of the best songs and some of my favorite songs on the entire tortured poets department track list um on the anthology. This is just going to be part one. We are wearing the um, original design Eras Tour t-shirt because I wore the one that had the anthology cover on it and another video and I didn't have this one yet. And I have this one now and it's really soft and comfortable and actually kind of kind of better um, in my opinion and I like it a little bit more. But anyway, we are going line by line through these songs and analyzing them like poetry. If you did not see the first part where I went through and I analyzed all of the Tortured Poets Department Standard Edition tracks, feel free to check that out. I annotated each and every one of the tracks there. I did it in glitter gel pen that I bought specifically like to annotate these tracks because I am an annotation fiend. I just want to be given literature and poetry and song lyrics and be asked to do this um, for compensation. I don't think that's a job, but here I am <laughs> providing regardless. Here we really just resorted to like pen, pencil, and highlighter. Very much less aesthetically pleasing, but it's fine. We are going through and picking apart the lyrics of this song like poetry and figuring out how it holds hands with the production and how it sounds and just kind of going through piece by piece and picking apart these songs. These are just the perspective of me as one girly, one swifty. These are pieces of art from an artist that I love dearly and have loved for a very long time and so I do have some bias in that way but also this is only my perspective and that's the great thing about songs and art is that they can be interpreted and can be felt and can be lived with and moved through and experienced in so many different ways and I think that that is partially the intention of some of these songs. You know Taylor has even talked about that being the beauty of some of her art and a lot of her work. So um, please do not take anything that I say personally. It is not meant personally towards anyone including Taylor herself. I love this artist or I would not be talking about her. Without further ado, let's get into talking about The Black Dog because, oh my god, <laughs> no one expected this from The Black Dog. No one knew that this was what The Black Dog was going to give us. That it was going to give us the cover of the anthology, that it was going to give us the artwork that was going to be like the picture for like the Tortured Poets Department. Black Dog is it. So it starts with the piano and we love just after the standard edition. I feel like starting with like a live piano feels so good. Not that I hated like all of the production on the standard edition, just I am a sucker for a piano. I love that LOML had a piano. It ricochets off of my heart and soul the deepest and so just starting with a solo piano but also beginning and having this very like solo stripped back piano sound makes some of the more like very intense productions on this pop um, more which is why I feel like there's a choice in this song that's made that I really, really love that, and people do love on this song. And it's made in another song on the standard edition and people are really annoyed with it there. Um, so we'll talk about that. It sounds like she's like just playing piano 
and she's like just finished crying and she sounds so hurt and it just comes off so vulnerable. There's something in her voice in the piano that aches and there's a cadence to it too. The way it sounds like she's just finished crying or is about to cry. The way she says, I am someone who until recent events you shared your secrets with and your location, you forgot to turn it off. I talked about her opening songs like this in so many of them. She's so good at putting you where she is sonically and then giving you a picture. She starts with you on the same page. We are in a very vulnerable, emotional place. We've either just finished crying or we are about to cry and we are playing the piano. We are just fresh off of a very close breakup. And then when she says you forgot to turn it off, like you forgot to turn your location off, that's when it hurts so bad because we're already like, oh, so near tears place after a breakup and we used to share a location with each other and then, oh, he forgot to turn it off. I don't like how I'm explaining this. Essentially, the fact that she puts you in the place and the scenario that she's in at the beginning of the song so well with the way she begins to sing with the cadence of the song with the production etc you are poised to be just as hurt by the fact that he forgot to turn off his location as she is that strikes you and it hurts and that light comes crashing down on you when she says that line just in the way that seeing the little blue dot and seeing that he forgot to turn off his location and like that whole moment crashes down on her and you're like together with her in it and she's so good at putting you together with her and taking you on the journey of her feelings through a song and like you end up in a different place at the end just like she does or you end up in the same place at the end if she does as I watch as you walk into some bar called the black dog and so you're sitting there and you can picture her on her find my friends watching the little dot go into the black dog and so I guess this was like a pub in the UK that he went to with his band like after they broke up it's not in London um the one in London is not this one I believe it's in either Ireland or Scotland it's weird this song is so deeply emotional and aching but the way it starts these statements are just very like factual she's not being very flowery with her language here she's being kind of short i am someone who until recent events you shared your secrets with and your location you forgot to turn it off and so i watch as you walk into some bar called the black dog these are very short kind of like non-emotional statements but the piano and the way that she's saying it doesn't make it sound like someone who's just going through evidence. It sounds like someone who is about to have a breakdown over watching this blue dot walk into this bar and pierce new holes in my heart. You forgot to turn it off. And the repetition here implies it. It could be, it could, so when I first listened to it and when I listened to it, I hear the repetition because she says that with just like some more sorrow when she says it the second time i hear it as her just sitting there and stuck on that blue dot and being like you forgot to turn it off and being stuck on that thought and ruminating on so did you intentionally leave it on you just you just forgot you forgot and so you just don't care that i'm like watching you walk around because and like how shitty is not caring like and then going down that whole emotional hole and just being like you forgot to turn it off um, and fixing on that but I've also heard people say that they think that like it like he forgot to turn off their connection as presented by her still having his location he forgot to turn off her heart that he pierced holes in and the way that she says like and pierce new holes in my heart a heart that's already had holes you forgot to turn it off and it hits me the the hits and the pierce are just they're very violent emotionally violent language i just don't understand and i love ugh. again this just really adds to the post breakup sitting there staring at your phone lost in your head for what feels like 10 minutes but you realize it's been like 30 that you've been like sitting there thinking 
and like scrolling and going to different Instagram profiles or just like staring at this blue dot and like looking up the bar and like looking at what it looks like on the inside and thinking about what's gonna happen when this song comes on eventually because eventually one of those songs is gonna come on and what's gonna happen and like I just don't understand is I feel like what you just keep coming back to after a breakup she just so she's so good she's so I feel like the last time she had a really deep devastating breakup like this was on red and we clung on to the heartbreak of those songs so incredibly much i love red red is my favorite taylor swift album and i've talked about so much on tortured poets how she so beautifully viscerally specifically talks about what it feels like to move through the world with the heart broken and be experiencing that because it's different for everybody because every relationship is different but it's also the same in some way because there is a lot of times something you just don't understand and whether it's their actions or the way the universe and time and things worked out or the way you can't get them off of you or something the I just don't understand how this happened or why you or how you or I wonder that is just it's just so incredibly relatable and then we jump into the chorus and the production up into this point has been really 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 stripped back but the beat hits when she says miss me and it slowly begins to build as the chorus builds and she's thinking about how you're there and there isn't a moment there's not a single moment where you don't miss what we had when someone plays one of our songs like the starting line which there's a whole thing with them and the starting line. He covered one of their songs at a show and was like, the starting line was absolutely mad for like coming out with that. Da -da -da -da. She says that at the starting line, but clearly that was one of their bands. And the person that he's with now is too young to have been into that music in any deep way because they weren't like young with it. You know how the music that you're in middle school with or the, middle, the music that you're a teenager with will always have that tinge to it and like it was made you were the exact age that that was made for a lot of the like 2000s 2010s um like pop teenage songs that came out i will always have a very like connection to those because they were in essence made for me at the time that they came out and so i will always feel that way about them the starting line was clearly one of those for both Taylor and Maddie and like bonding over that bonding over that is huge I I will admit that there are albums like if you can talk to me about some of the albums that I was really like deep in it with um in high school or middle school or even elementary school really truly I'm kind of more likely to be into you <laughs> or want to be your friend so it kind of is painful to think of like something that you have that connection with and then they're just they just don't they don't miss that at all like that was so you guys really had it like you guys really had like threads of your memories and your personalities that intertwined and made sense and that you really like connected on a deeper level with and he's just there with someone who he clearly it implies that he doesn't have that with now is that true based on her not knowing this one song I don't know but she is too young to have the same adolescent memories that they share that created the magic fabric of their dreaming and then she kind of ties up the whole chorus with old habits die screaming so she ends the rabbit hole of thoughts of don't you miss how perfectly we fit and don't you miss this and don't you miss that and aren't you sitting there thinking this and doesn't this happen with a cry out of how hard it is to let go the phrase the original phrase is old habits die hard she's so good at taking turns of phrase or things that we know as like overused pieces of advice um or like fabled characters or archetypes or whatever and we're gonna talk about that a lot more um than we already have even in previous songs on this part of the album just you waking the phrase old habits die hard and saying no old habits die screaming not just hard isn't enough that's a very bland adjective she says screaming and i can just picture like it's the breakdowns of a breakup like this and feeling and grieving the death 
of your dreaming and everything that you thought was and everything that you thought you had and saying I just don't understand and going down these rabbit holes and picturing everything you did together and every moment you have and questioning it and then also picturing them now and watching the blue dot walk into another bar and wondering what's happening because you can see what's happening but you don't know you can't text that person but they're on their your phone their location is on your phone but you can't have access in that way but like they won't turn off their goddamn location Oh God, it's it's maddening. Like an addiction, um, the habit of him, the habit of this connection is dying screaming. It is dying a little bit with every breakdown, with every crying session, with every, you know, moment like this. So then we go into a new verse and it's kind of like we're in the light of day again and we have a new vignette and we're moving again. I move through the world with the heart broken. Time moves differently for the heart broken. My longings stay unspoken. More production kind of comes in um, in this verse a little bit. It's just it's just the teeniest, teeniest bit more hopeful, the teeniest bit more, more, more lifted, only the smallest bit. And I may never open up the way I did for you. It's the phrase open up, I feel like. Um, that makes that phrase hurt so much. And to feel like you could never really do that again because of how deeply betrayed that you were by this person who you felt like you could really never say the wrong thing with. My longings stay unspoken like they were in Guilty as Sin, but now it's the unspoken like they were in I Can Do It With A Broken Heart. And all of those best laid plans, talking rings and talking cradles, you said I needed a brave man and proceeded to play him until I believed it too. A con man sells a fool, a get love quick scheme, a man swinging a sword he could barely lift um, in the prologue to this album but then also proceeded to play him in army doll, just a doll though, it was not actually the brave man. Um, he was just playing the brave man because he couldn't actually lift the sword. He was like, you need this. And you know what? I can do that. I can step into that role, but he just really wasn't ever actually that. He was just a con man and it kills me. Going from it hits me to it kills me. It's like the more you think about it, the more it hurts when you're in this mindset of this song. And then you're back to I just don't understand. It pierces holes in her heart. She's been hit and now she's been killed. Like every night when she performs The Smallest Man whoever lived. From I Believed It To, the production kind of starts to pull back again. The slight lift is gone. It's really, really back to completely stripped back. And then it comes back again with Miss Me in the shower. And the thing is, is so the thing that I really think about this line is in the shower and remember how my rain soaks body was shaking. The rain show where she told everyone that her life finally made sense in all aspects. I suspect her rain-soaked body was shaking after that and she took a shower. The thing about this line is that it could be that and the shower's like together, or it could also, you know, be if you want it to be innocent in the shower, he's in the shower and that's where you're like alone and you have time to be like laid bare with your thoughts um, and ruminate on things and like feel your regrets and have feelings because you're just kind of like there alone with your shower thoughts and he was with her at that rain show where her rain soaked body was probably shaking he probably hugged her and felt that whether it was in or out of a shower it's really not anyone's business do you hate me always a question in every breakup but especially when you leave in a cruel way um that's very much a question was it hazing to get in to some sort of exclusive club for a cruel fraternity of him and his his bros his artsy bros that i pledged by saying you were my one and I still mean it I'd still be a part of it if that's what this was if you turned back around and were like you made it in you really meant it it broke your heart when I deserted you come on back she's like quietly saying like oh well, if you changed your mind I'd still come back she gets it she's saying the things that we don't want to say about breakups out loud 
out loud because even even if you know that like this is for the best even if you are like i don't actually even want you back there's a small part of you that's like but if that all wasn't a lie if that was all actually what i thought it was and we could make it all true again and this was all just a joke maybe there's a small part of me that could get over that Maybe that would be better than this. I don't know, I love the way she puts that. Was it hazing for a cruel fraternity I pledged? And I still mean it because old habits die screaming because it is an old habit to still mean it, to still be wanting the person that you had, the person that you wanted. Oh, and then we get into the bridge. The song just keeps giving, you guys. The song just keeps giving. Six weeks of breathing clean air. It's giving the clean bridge. Give it up for the clean bridge, you guys. I'm sorry. She's just, every time she's mentioned, we have to give her just a round, a round of applause. Alien Imogen really just killed it on that one. Um, but this is giving, this is giving that. This is giving a sister of that. Six weeks of breathing clean air. I still miss the smoke. And there's this weird, like, there's this faint, like, inhale behind this line of I still miss the smoke. Um, but also that smoke was a haze of a situation ship um so she still misses kind of the i don't know like it's like you'd rather be in the situation ship than be feeling like shit. even though it might have been like a smoky haze and or you still miss it also smoke is kind of maddie's metaphor that in the sparkling eyes there's a bunch of them another one is wanting what is probably worse for you but saying but daddy i love him and running with your dress unbuttoned and flooring it through the fences anyway and smoke is generally probably not great for your lungs but she misses it anyway were you making fun of me with some esoteric joke um my question about that line is does she mean during the relationship or after was he making fun of her either way when someone is cruel to you and they leave you really do wonder if they were like making fun of you the whole time or if they're making fun of you now now i want to sell my house and set fire to all my clothes oh, because that's where the relationship took place and he has rubbed his freaking memory all over all of them over the time they spent together and the months and the years he's tainted them but also he left her there naked and alone when he dropped her down after doing experiments on her like in down bad because he ruined all of the things that he had with his memory and his stink his smoky cigarette stink and hire a priest to come and exercise my demons he was her religion she chose them religiously and now but it now turns out that that religion she's taken in to her heart was really a demon that she needs ripped out of her now even if it kills her even if she dies screaming and the way she says die screaming here is so victorious like even if it kills me i will have this ripped out of me and you know what i hope you hear it and that's like kind of what this song in this album is she hopes he hears all of the pain of that exorcism and everything he did to her and everything maybe that she gains from it even in this song, in this album and etc. Also, we need to go back and we need to talk about the banging in old habits, die screaming. There's this like really hard, like intense banging um, production that comes in when she says old habits die screaming and it happens every single time. And that line, it's so crazy. There's just so much packed into this one moment of like old habits die screaming. It's very painful and intense and it leaves this like echo, like a shriek or a scream would. And I think that banging production can work. Um, I didn't have a problem with it in My Boy Breaks His Favorite Toys. I don't personally have a problem with it in Florida. Do I think I could have been, it could have been done a little bit better? Maybe. Do I get why people don't like it? Yes. Do I think it absolutely works here? Big, big yes, um, would not change a single thing. The word screaming and the way that she screams it along with the production makes it sound like something violent and painful is occurring, which really ties in super well with the idea of old habits dying, shrieking, and screaming. It's kind of, it reminds me of old habits die hard, married with the phrase going, kicking, and screaming. Like this habit is going, kicking, and screaming. It is not going anywhere easy. It is going to go kicking and screaming 
all the way. Um, and that is in the form of being addicted to sitting and staring at a dot on your phone and having breakdowns where you say, I just don't understand. Did you hate do you hate me? Did you hate me? I still mean it. Were you making fun of me? I want to sell all my clothes and set fire to my house and exercise this demon from me. And it's kind of different when she says, even if I die screaming, it is so much more victorious and a little bit less violent. And it feels like this huge step forward, this breakthrough um, in this healing process, because the healing process is a series of breakdowns. And in this breakdown, each chorus is kind of a breakdown. And so with this final chorus saying, and I hope it's shitty instead of don't you miss me. She's not hoping he misses her anymore. She's going through the stages of grief from sadness to anger to some sort of flashes of empowerment. And there will be other breakdowns, but this is the first one where she's able to say, you know what? I hope it's shitty in the black dog when someone plays the starting line and she's too young to know this song. And I hope it feels awful um, because you know what you did and it was intertwined in the tragic fabric of our dreaming it's no longer magic she's not romanticizing it in that way anymore she's accepting it as being over there's still emotion there but she can look back on it as something that ended badly and is over and not something that she's looking back on with sparkling eyes and calling magic it's just coming from a different place tail between your legs you're leaving like a cowardly little dog. Um, we love the idea of dog language in a song called The Black Dog that's not even about a dog. And we're back to being sad with I still can't believe it because old habits die screaming. And so it still aches and it still hurts, but we're getting there, you know? And it's like we saw a step forward in this song. And I think that's what like feels so good about this song to so many people is that you start at rock bottom with her and you go through that breakdown and you wake up the next morning and you move through the world with your heart broken and you have another breakdown about how the fuck he doesn't remember how your rain soaked body was shaking and he doesn't miss you and you think about how you still miss the smoke but you get eventually to saying one night, you know what, I hope it's shitty in the black dog. And that is growth. That is healing. That is moving from one stage of grief to the next. And you know what, you will go back and forth and back and forth, but eventually the progress will continue forward. And the, it's encompassing one of those steps forward in this song. And it feels so good and cathartic to go through that and meet with her at the end. But she's still so realistic in saying, I still can't believe it. But she acknowledges that she knows that she still can't believe it because old habits die screaming, because it's an old, old, old flame that is going to take a long time to put out. But she knows this and she's accepting the pain of that process and the fact that it is what's best for her now. She's back to kind of like the trembling tone of voice that we had in the beginning of the song and it ends with a gasp because it's like it's a gasp but there's no sigh at the end it's just a gasp you don't hear what the exhale is and she doesn't she doesn't let you it's just a gasp um and if it was an exhale you would know that she didn't start to sob um and so the fact that it is just the gasp makes you wonder if the exhale is a sob i feel like that's kind of the implication. There are so many tears implied in this song. Um, so now that we've reveled in the magic of the black dog, we move to I'm gonna get you back in all lowercase, all squished together. And the song is good and it's different. And it, I feel like this song would have fit maybe a little bit better on Midnight's almost. It's just, it's it sounds a little midnightsy, and it sounds even maybe a little, dare I say, reputation-y. Um, and so like, I think it's a little bit of an odd one out. And so I think that's why people tend to not listen to it quite as much. Um, also the structure of it is a little bit different, but I do like it and I do think it's very clever in its own way. It really captures this very like, you've pissed me off in the past, but there are still things about you that I'm very attracted to. And if you played your cards right, we could make this work. And I really like you too, but if you don't, 
and might have to punch you in the face. And there's a whole like sexual charge to it. It's very flirty, it's very fun. Lilac short skirt, the one that fits me like skin. I'm just picturing a tight, um, kind of almost like a pleathery um, lilac mini skirt, maybe like a little high waisted. I don't think that it's the pickleball skirt. I think the pickleball skirt's cute. I don't think we're talking about the pickleball skirt here. I could be wrong. I feel like this is a like more of a going out outfit because this song has a very going out vibe, but I could, I could be wrong. I'd be very curious to know what lilac skirt she's talking about. We will never be able to keep track of all of Taylor Swift's clothes, so. But it just starts giving a very like sexy vibe. Like we are on the hunt here. Lilac short skirt, the one that fits me like skin. Did your research, you knew the price going in. And it's interesting, like, so like, we're pretty sure the song is like mostly about Maddie. Um, and in the next song, we talk about like the whole price and him being aware of it or not and what have you. Like the price and the danger, I guess, of being in a relationship with Taylor Swift and the publicness of all of that and the, is she gonna write a song about you? And the questioning and just the misogyny and everything that comes in part and parcel um, with dating Taylor Swift and people knowing that you're dating Taylor Swift because you can only be dating Taylor Swift for so long without people knowing about it and then once they do just things happen um, and the next song very much talks about that but we're not talking about that song now we're talking about this one so he did his research on all of that knew the price going in um, and he was constantly like talking about her like on the mic um, like in like interviews and stuff and like probably mutual friends I'm sure because there were plenty of them and then she says, I'll tell you one thing, honey. She's so confident and flirty in this song. She's like, no, like, I know my power and like, I don't need this. I kind of sort of want it. So if we could make this work, that would be great. But don't fuck with me. Don't fuck up my life. Don't come for my job. I can tell when somebody still wants me. Come clean. You're guilty as sin too. I see you standing at the bar like something's funny, making some like, I I totally get that. Standing at the bar like something's funny, bubbly. Once you fix your face, I'm going in. I think it's so funny. So what I picture here is like staring at each other like across the room and he's either like laughing, like talking to someone like something's funny. Um, And she's like, what are you laughing at? Like, why are you making a show of like, laughing and being this like obnoxious person like once you like fix your face and stop acting like this i'm going in i'm gonna start i'm gonna go and see see what's up um but i'm not gonna do it when you're making jokes across the bar that are revolting and far too loud or he's giving her one of those like flirty little um like smirk things like something's funny and she's like no i'm not i'm not fucking with you like this um so once you once you knock the fuck off i'll come over um, and we can do this. I'm not gonna play the game with you. There will be twin to happen. It will be by me. Because I'm a mastermind with a plan who's going in, but doesn't know whether I'm gonna be your wife or smash up your bike. And this song just keeps going back from love to hate, love to violence. Um, and like, there's something very sexy about like, you know, love, violence, um, that's a whole, a whole thing. It's a very common thing that people love to kind of like play with. It's very intriguing, very sexy. Um, and I think she does it in a very tasteful, sexy, clever way here. So whether I'm going to be your wife and this is going to be forever, or I'm going to smash up your bike in 1975, there is a line about my bike. Um, like all we need is my bike and something, something. Um, and she did, and he did dedicate that song to Taylor in the past. So she hasn't decided yet. She is going to get him back. She doesn't know what she means by that though. And maybe after he fixes his face and she can go in, she can find out. Whether I'm gonna curse you out or take you back to my house, violence and love, I haven't decided yet, but I'm going to get you back. And then it gets a lot softer and quieter. And so we have this kind of like, I don't know, like I know what I'm doing, I'm gonna get you back and I'm gonna decide which way that's gonna be in. But then there's kind of like this soft whisper, like hopefulness that she's like, I hear the whispers in your eyes when I see the look on your face from across the room. And so there's kind of like this hope of like, I, I see your sparkling eyes. I know when someone still wants me, I'm going to make you think twice, think twice about us not being 
meant to be because you're going to find that you were never not mine and you're mine now. Ugh, it's the second you're mine that is so like, we're back to being the aggressor. Cause it gets very soft and she's like, I hear the whispers in your eyes and you can almost hear there's a little bit of her that's like, they're, they're just whispers in his eyes. You know, that's not, it's not like super overt, but she's like, I hear them, they're there. There's kind of that um, dance between security and insecurity that we see in Slut of like, you're not saying you're in love with me, that you're going to um, when she says you'll find that you are never not mine and then she switches back to being the aggressor that she's been until this part of the song when she says you're mine small talk big love i feel like that's a great way to describe mutual flirting like you're just kind of having these this like banter and like little small talks but you're both like very engaged and like hearing the whispers in each other's eyes act like i don't care what you did I'm an Aston Martin that you steered straight into the ditch and ran and hid. Now, I am so curious. I find this line so interesting because I feel like you just blow past it because you're like, Psh, yeah, that is what Maddie did. But like, that's what he did when she's saying you crashed my party in your rental car in like the 2020s. But if this is prior to that, um, because I don't think she's singing this after that happened what it seems like happened is that they were kind of like close to maybe like getting together but it never quite happened and then she ended up with calvin harris and that was probably pretty upsetting to him um is the gist that people have kind of worked out but i find that to be such a like if she's an aston martin that he steered straight into a ditch then ran and hid he would have had to be driving um, like to actually like have had her and for them to be a thing. And so that to me implies that there was some sort of situationship prior to this. Anyway, we're back to, and I'll tell you one thing, honey, it's giving the power that she feels in herself in Bejeweled. Baby love, I think I've been a little too kind. Let's believe I'm still Bejeweled. And when I meet the band, they ask, do you have a man? I can still say, I don't remember. And I'll tell you one thing, honey. I can take the upper hand and touch your body, flip the script, and leave you like a dumb house party. Or I might just love you till the end. When I'm down, I'm down, and I can make you down too. But when I'm done, I'm done. And there's no changing that. Rock to another chorus about being your wife, smashing up your bike, flipping you off or pulling you into a closet and hearing the whispers in your eyes and making him want to think twice. And then we come into this fun bridge. I can feel it coming humming in the way you move. That feels like the same thing as hearing the whispers in your eyes. Like you are getting all of these non-verbal cues and clues that someone is down, that someone's on the same page, that someone is into you. The reset button is being pushed what we had before is in the past this is a new relationship now say you got somebody i'll say i got someone too see now that makes me think that this was definitely written in the guiltiest sin chapter this is like pre-guiltiest sin we're beginning to become guiltiest sin because we're seeing that we think we might be we might be a little guilty and then we're seeing the whispers in his eyes that he might be a little guilty too because i've got someone and he's got someone too but even if it's handcuffed i'm leaving here with you from being guilty for being together or for attacking him from violence or in a sexual way. There are a lot of different ways you can take that even if it's handcuffed, I'm leaving here with you. Because the whole I'm gonna get you back or I'm gonna get you back is if it's handcuffed together or handcuffed as in like, I just beat the shit out of a man, I'm going to get arrested. But then the like, say you got somebody, I say I got someone too, even if it's handcuffed, I'm leaving here with you. There's just having those lines next to each other and then in this song that kind of has these little sexual undertones, but then also having it just so strongly tied, in my opinion, to Guilty as Sin. Um, and then Guilty as Sin being tied to Fresh Out the Slammer, the, the way she says, even if it's handcuffed, I'm leaving here with you is just very loaded um, to me and could have like all of these different layers to it. 
bygones will be bygone eras fading into gray. Such a clever line because it's like a bygone era is a time like long past and then bygones will be bygones is a like water under the bridge like we're not gonna think about it anymore all good we were just kids babe so this is them saying we were just kids babe and then guilty of sin and then fresh out the slammer and then like you see how we roll you see how we roll this totally could have been on the main album i think it fits really well chronologically but anyway um bygones will be bygones and then eras fading in to gray that line made me really sad to hear because i don't want any taylor swift eras to fade into gray i want her to still hold on to them all in her heart um as i do and all of the eras have different colors and so i don't want them to fade into gray although the 1975 colors are like black and white um and so like she is fading in to gray in to him i don't want her heirs to fade though so that just made me a little sad but we broke all the pieces but still want to play the game because her boy only breaks his favorite toys but they just want to keep on playing um because they cannot get enough of each other um that doesn't work necessarily perfectly but i think that kind of those metaphors are kind of similar because if they did break all of the pieces then like her boy did break something that mattered to him and now they're trying to play again. Told my friends, I hate you, but deep down, I still love you just the same. Pick your poison, babe. I'm poison either way. Whether she hates you or she loves you, she is going to be your poison. Um, and isn't that so very Taylor Swift? Once you're in the Taylor Swift universe, there's no getting out of it. It's poison either way. She is the snake. Um, and once you've been bitten with the venom, you just can't suck it out because and then she goes back to and I haven't decided yet what kind of venom you're gonna be getting um but we'll see and the song wraps up um so good so fun I love it I don't know why this song I picture a club with some lights um and the color lilac let me know if there are any like images that like are attached to any of these songs for you please let me know I see like a very dark warm wood um green um kind of like old smells vaguely like beer Irish pub um for the black dog we have reached the albatross. I love this song and the more I've listened to it the more I have loved it. So I've spoken previously about how Taylor Swift is really good at something that she does. She does a lot but on this album she does it in Who's Afraid of Little Me, she does it in LOML. She's really good at taking well-known sayings, pieces of folklore, archetypes, and playing with them to say or fit what she's trying to say. She's starting with something that we already have a lot of context for, something that we already understand, and then she adds her own feelings and adds her own context to it, and then our understanding grows deeper and richer and more specific. Ultimately, this song is a fable made up of fables, and that's like the genius of it. The idea behind a folk tale or a fable is often a story using characters or archetypes like the naughty little child, the fool, the sage wise, you know, person, um, the mother, the princess. There's just, there's a lot of things that we just being raised in a society um, kind of understand as a concept. And so folk tales and fables typically have a lot of those and they use those characters and archetypes within a story to usually teach a sneaky or sometimes like not so sneaky lesson a lot of times using misdirection and like riddles sometimes not always but often um and this song does that on multiple levels and the way it sounds is very much like a story like a folk tale being told while someone's like playing um the strings along with it we're just talking about the production now um before we get into like all of the lyrics because once i get into them i don't think i can get out of them um i've discovered and so the way it's like dun, 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 like it's just going like line by line piece of the story by piece of the story and the pacing of it is very folktale like and very story like and like it just kind of feels like it's set for you to follow along with in the verses i think what contributes to what i'm trying to describe here is the way the language is the way the language and the pacing are very much how a folktale type thing would be told um there's a very like consistent um rhythm to it 
and the lines are very simple um, and have a very like simple rhyme scheme to them, but they're like a little bit deceptively simple. Um, they're like a little bit riddly. Rose by other name is a scandal. You know, it's a little bit, a little bit tricky um, in a fun way. But then the chorus comes and it's just this soaring falsetto and it's really pretty and it just makes me think of someone falling and a bird swooping in and catching them, which is exactly what happens um, in the last chorus. So wise men once said, wild winds are death to the candle. All of this language is so like folktale coded, it is so like folk more coded if you want to get swifty about it from this very first line. The idea of like wise men um, of old, I guess, is kind of implied and that language just kind of keeps coming from this idea of this being something that is a legend, something that was foretold, something that wise men have spoken about and whispered about for ages. Um, that kind of vibe just keeps coming up and it just kind of, it marries with the production and all of the other little metaphors and references and stuff to create just this beautiful, I picture this song as an old leather book titled The Albatross um, with a little bird on the front. Wild winds are death to the candle. Love's a fragile little flame. It could burn out anybody. Something delicate and beautiful like a little flame could be whipped out by wild winds. Love's a fragile little flame, it could burn out. Who who said it better, truly? A rose by any other name is a scandal. I'm obsessed. So the original line is from Romeo and Juliet when Romeo is like, well, why can't you just change your name? Why does your name matter? Um, because the whole thing is that they're from feuding families and their last names and blah. Um, and so he's like, why didn't you just change your name? What's what's a name? Um, what is in a name? A rose by any other name would smell as sweet. I don't remember who says it, Romeo or Juliet, but that's what they're talking about. So the idea is something beautiful by any no other name is just as beautiful. It has the same effect. But she's saying a rose by any other name is a scandal. So something beautiful when it is denoted or called something else, by whoever um, becomes a scandal. When people decide that it's something other than something simple and beautiful like a rose, um, it becomes a scandal. Where have we seen that happen? Cautions issued, he stood shooting the messengers. So cautions issued, that's very tempered and like not aggressive, but he is standing firm and he's shooting which is very aggressive the messengers um and so the idea of shooting the messenger is like the idea of lashing out and taking your anger of a situation out on the person who delivered the message to you about that situation and so cautions were issued by these messengers who were just trying to caution him but he stood firm and shot them down just for saying that but that's kind of the implication of those words they tried to warn him about her. That's so ominous. That sounds like the last, like there would be a dot, dot, dot after that on the page. And then on the next page, there would be like a big fight or something. Um, so the messengers tried to warn him about her among others um, because they in this song to me I feel like refers to like the, the collective they. And then we jump into this beautiful cross your thoughtless heart so originally it's cross my heart and hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. Um, and that's like, it was like a thing that like religious children would say to like say that they weren't lying. Cause I guess like um, you were like crossing your heart, like crossing your heart with the sign of the cross, like promising to like the Lord that you were telling the truth. And if you weren't, um, you were saying like, I hope the Lord strikes me dead and you can stick a needle in my eye to make sure that I'm dead because apparently that's what they did um, to like ensure a corpse was dead. You remember there's that whole thing. If you listen to like any morbid or like true crime podcast, I'm sure you've heard about the thing of like there being bells on, um, things and like scratches in coffins because people were getting like buried alive I guess um in like the olden times it was happening for like varying reasons um but like that was an issue and so I guess they evolved somehow to just um to make sure and if they weren't how far did the need cross my heart and hope to die stick a needle in my eye so you're saying like I promise I'm not lying so you're crossing your thoughtless heart being like, I am all in. And this person's heart is 
thoughtless. They are all heart. There is no head to their heart. So they are swearing that they are all in. May they be struck dead um, if they are lying, but they are crossing a heart that is completely thoughtless in all emotions and they are all in with that thoughtless heart. Only liquor anoints you. So connecting back to kind of, I guess, like the religious origins of that, but also I choose you religiously. Um, anointing something is making something holy and like acclaiming it as like a holy thing um as part of the church or whatever and so only liquor makes you holy could that be makes you true makes you truthful makes you yourself i i don't know um here drinks are the only thing that makes him that though so feel like the very happy light twinkly sound of this mirrors the kind of like crossing your thoughtless heart like throwing yourself happily into the fire um because it says she's here to destroy you but it just sounds so pretty and happy um when she says it even though the lines are very foreboding and so i feel like that just kind of mirrors the like someone thoughtless being all heart and just throwing themselves in and ending up falling and needing to be caught by the person that people were warning them about but we'll get there she is the albatross she is here to destroy you what a big like all-encompassing like mythical statement not like she's here to break your heart like she is here to destroy you like i am here to destroy you uh, i just picture like the terminator <laughs> like coming to destroy you or just like this big dark mythical um Thing. So we're continuing on with our story. A wise man once said, one bad seed kills the garden. And at first when you hear that, you're like, is he the one bad seed or is she? But as you go through the song, you realize that the wise men are all talking shit about her. And they're saying things that are harmful to her and the sustenance of her relationship. Does that sound familiar to anything that we have heard on the standard version of this album? <laughs> um, I think so. I think several times over. One bad seed kills the garden. So she is the bad influence, the one thing in the garden that's like poisoning it all. One less temptress, one less dagger to sharpen, locked me up in towers. So she's locked up, so we don't have to deal with her. We don't have to kill her, um, but she's not out there in the garden poisoning everything. We have her locked up, um, we have her taken care of and put away. But I visit in your dreams. I do believe she speaks about that in Guilty as Sin. Also very like legendy, like she was locked away in towers, but she would visit in dreams. And they tried to warn you about me. Again, they are, they're screaming, they're issuing cautions. We have another chorus that has some extra lines in it now. We're building upon the chorus. I love each chorus gets more and more interesting and we delve deeper into the story with each one. It's amazing. She's the albatross, she is here to destroy you. Devils that you know raise worse hell than a stranger. And that's very much something that people say. I feel like people talk about that in terms of like how fights with your family are like the absolute worst. Dating someone that you know really well is even more risky than dating someone that you've never met before. Um, it can be applied to a lot of different things, but clearly they have a little bit of history. They've known each other before. So devils that you know, or that you think you know, raise worse hell than a stranger. She's the death you chose when you stood shooting the messengers and crossing your thoughtless heart. You are in terrible danger. You are in terrible danger. And when that sky rains fire on you and your persona non grata, the sky, she's an albatross. She spends all of her time in the sky. And so when it rains fire on him and your persona non grata, the person that everyone is against, the person that everyone universally hates, I'll tell you how I have been there too. She spends all her time in the sky. She's been rained fire on before and that none of it matters. Public opinion is based on falsehood and also doesn't change how I see you. I love you whether you're persona non grata or not. So we continue with our story and the sky's about to rain fire on him. Wise men, they read fake news and they believed it. We're wise and they were once saying all of these things and now they read fake news and they believed it. 
jackals, these spindly, hungry dogs were alerted to something they believed to be true. They raised their hackles and they attacked viciously and without warning. You were sleeping soundly when they dragged you from your bed. He wasn't doing anything. He was behaving in innocent when he was attacked, but they heard something that they thought was absolutely true, even though maybe it wasn't, and they were on the alert, and then they attacked, and it was for blood, and he couldn't conceive it. And even though this song reiterates so many times, she's the albatross, she is here to destroy you. They tried to warn him about her. They tried to warn you about me. Devils that you know raise worth hell of a stranger. She's the death you chose. He's somehow still shocked. He still somehow couldn't conceive um, that they dragged him from his bed. It's still shocking. Um, but the thing is, is that she tried to warn him about them. They, the ones that have been warning him all along, were the ones that attacked him. This whole time, it's they, the people that warned him about her. Because the danger is really how people become when someone is with her, not her. She is not the monster. The people are the monster because they get weird and wild when someone is with her. And so they sit there and say, don't be with her, don't be with her, she's crazy, she's crazy, you're in danger, you're in danger, you're in danger, and she is in danger. And so she saw him falling and, sky, and the sky was raining fire on him and after they dragged him from his bed and she crossed her thoughtless heart, she jumped in no thoughts all heart, spread her wings like a parachute, she is the giant albatross a monster on a hill sweeping in at his rescue to save him from them who had been proclaiming to be the good guys all along. The devil that you know may raise worse hell than a stranger, but now it seems more like an angel. It turns out that she is not the danger. She is the life that you chose in all of this terrible danger that is in fact still there, but it's not her. And it ends with a perfect little kind of like proverb to summarize the complexity and the misdirection of the song. So cross your thoughtless heart. She's the albatross. She is here to destroy you. Um, and you look back at that and you're like, ah, uh, is she here to destroy you? Um, I guess, I guess he is being destroyed, but is she here to destroy him? So I, I really enjoy this song. I feel like that's a pretty common opinion. Let me know if you also like this song. I know it's very popular to like the black dog, um, but I, I, I feel like this one also, this one also deserves some attention. Um, I know it's not as like emotionally um, jarring and the production isn't as flashy, but I, I like this one. I don't want to call it an Evermore reject because that me means that like to be honest, I like this song more than some of the songs in Evermore. Okay, we're not gonna talk about that anymore. Next song. Hello, it is me editing this video. I think we are going to actually end this one here. I know it's only an hour long, um, but it is already an hour long and I have a super, super, super busy week and a lot that I have to do and I'm not entirely sure that I can edit through the rest of these songs and like do them justice and actually make it like a fun, entertaining video for you guys um, and not just me like trying to speed through talking about some of these songs that I really, really, really like and want to talk about. So yeah, hopefully that's okay with you guys. Hopefully you enjoyed this. If you did, feel free to give it a like. It makes my heart so so very happy um every time i see another little like thank you guys for 500 of all of y'all the like 14 year old that was like obsessed with youtube in my heart um who i still am in my soul is screaming so yeah thank you guys and thank you for being here and i will see you very very soon in the next one i have a chapel roan video that i've been planning on doing forever i've been a stan for so long i cannot believe i haven't talked about her um there's just oh there's so much i'd like to do but i simply do not have time for more than just this video this week and i absolutely wanted to um put something up so yeah thank you guys and i will see you very soon yeah, the glitter gel pens i got from the dollar store and they kind of died 75% of the way through the standard edition